Okay, we'll we are good. We are good to in. go on the. Yeah, we're good to go on the recording. Awesome. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Happy Friday to everyone. How y'all doing? Thank you for joining us today. You know, one of the things we like to do, if you'd like to put in where you're joining us from on the chat, that way we can kind of see where in the world you are. I'm from Orlando, Florida, but I'm currently in Lakeland, Florida. So, um, hi from India. That's amazing. Thank you for joining us. South Carolina. Vancouver, British Here's, Columbia. <laughs> that's awesome. So if you hear a little bit of the noise in the background, you're here in Lakeland, Florida. Beautiful Lakeland, Florida. So in, in order to keep with the schedule, we're going to um, just wait a couple minutes and then we'll do the quick introduction so we can get started because there's a lot of great information that we can, um, that we're gonna get through today. So um, we wanna make sure that the speakers have a lot of time um, to be able to share with us. Natasha, how are you? Good to see you here. Hi, everyone. I'm Mina Kalili. I'm uh, one of the co-chairs of the AIGA DEC. And periodically, you'll see in the chat that we will post um, some links to our various social media, the design teaching resource, um, and other ways that you can get in touch with us uh, after this event and when it's over. Um, we are also very thankful to our uh, speakers today on this panel who are allowing us to record. Um, so once again, thank you to our speakers for allowing us to do that. This, re this recording will be available um, after the event. Thank you, Mina. And our own uh, Natalie put in the, um, in the chat, if you could sh share with us how you found out about our event, that would be really, really helpful in us uh, gauging uh, how we're getting the word out. So if you found out through Instagram, through Facebook, the newsletter, through Twitter, through word of mouth, uh, of a friend of a friend, through smoke signals, whatever it is, however it was that you found out about us, please let us know. And we would be highly appreciative. So we are the AIGA Design Educators uh, Community. My name is Victor Davila, and on, the, on behalf of our board, we'd like to welcome you to the June event. Um, today, we have an amazing panel. Um, and as Mina um, mentioned, it is a recorded panel. So if, um, if you have to duck out for whatever reason, if your uh, connection gets disconnected for whatever reason, you can always go back to the recordings and find out um, uh, what you missed. So um, again, if you're just joining us, please put in in the chat where you're joining us from and how you found out about us. And that would help us out a lot. We have a lot of great events coming up in the, in the near future, including um, our shifted events, which um, is coming up in August, which we'll be hearing more about coming up and some monthly events that we have coming up as well. So be on the lookout for our newsletters, follow us on Facebook, join us on Instagram, all that fun stuff. Um, Without further ado, I'd like to introduce the moderator of our panel who will introduce the panel as we go forward. Uh, today, we'll be talking about crossing boundaries and please welcome Yohan An, who is going to moderate the panel for us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Victor, to introduce me. Can you hear? Okay, great. Thank you. I can. Hello. Uh, can you? Yes, good. Hello, my name is Yeo Hyun An. I'm very nice to see you all today. Uh, thank you for uh, AIGA DC's steering committee members to invite this, this panel discussion today. And today, this panel will discuss the future of graphic design education and practices. 
crossing boundaries among graphic design, creative coding, 3D printing, and augmented reality with activism. Pioneers of transdisciplinary graphic design in higher education will share their evolving graphic design research and practices, transcending their trans, uh, traditional visual design boundaries. The panelists are today, Yeohyun Nam, I'm an assistant professor of graphic design and interaction design in the art department at the University of Wisconsin Medicine. I'm specialized in generative typography and graphic design and diversity in graphic design education. And another panelist, Taegyeom Lee, Taegyeom Lee, can you just hold your hand? Good, thank you. Taegyeom Lee is an assistant professor of graphic design at Iowa State University. He just specializes in tangible typography and graphic design with digital fabrication. And where is Justin Lincoln? Justin Lincoln, great. Justin Lincoln is associate professor of art at Whitman College. He just specializes in creative coding for digital humanities and human-centered art and design. So let's go to Heather. Can you raise your Heather Queen? Yeah, this is Heather Queen. Uh, she is assistant professor of design at DePaul University. He, she is specializing in experience design speculative design and leadership to support emerging and diverse designers and educators. Last panelist, Adam Delmasel. Adam Delmasel, can you just to great, thank you. Adam Delmasel is an instructor of graphic design and Pen, uh, Pennsylvania College of Art and Design. He just specializes in printmaking design activism with a gorilla projection and augmented reality. Also, he was a visiting artist at the University of Wisconsin Medicine. Each presenter will have a 15 minute presentation that I will start my presentation. Then next go to Taegyeom Lee and Justin Lincoln, Heather Queen and Adam Delmasel. So, I will share my screen soon. So let me just go to share my screen and go to, can you see this one? Okay, so I'm gonna just go to make the full screen. Can you see? Okay, great, thank you, Mina. Okay, good. So again, great to see you all today. I'm Yeo hyun -an. I'm also the professor of graphic design in the art department at the University of Wisconsin Medicine. Today, I'd like to talk about developing a generative typography system for floral typography. Have you heard about floral typography? Yes? I'm gonna just go to the next one. Floral typography is a design trend that combines typography, calligraphy, and lettering with the floral elements. With the help of floral elements, we can create very tempting and vivid artworks in which the typography seems to be shaped by plants and flowers. This is a floral poster series by uh, Alexandra Cook. Uh, Kakobi that it expresses flourishing visual effects with the text flower and flowers. I'm gonna go to the next one. This is wedding invitation by Roman Gulman. Also floral typography design, we love you so much by Gregory Barangon. Then you can see it's a floral typography. Then this is a modern calligraphy and floral watercolor pure joy in every step on the left and the letter A on the right, watercolor floral alphabet, that letter A. This is a floral typefaces. Floral, like aloha, dream, flower, flora, and banquet that as you see, floral elements has been used for calligraphy, lettering, typeface, posters and invitational cards, et cetera. I'm gonna, my inspiration, I'm gonna just change a little bit screen uh, setting. 
to see my okay, face. I'm gonna open it. I was inspired by Marian Benzis's work. She is an expressive illustrator, typographer. For instance, I want it all by using natural plural elements as typographic art. She is known for her custom letterings, intricate paddling and decorative style. The Marian Benzis was a huge my inspiration of my typography. I'm gonna go to background of my project. Today, I wanna share with you. This project began with a floral illustration that I created in 2019. I was inspired by Korean contemporary Christian music. I'm originally from South Korea. A fountain of life springs up here. Any audience who can read Korean, you can read Korean, but I'm reading English. A fountain of life springs up here. When tears pass, sooner or later, it will bear fruit. The sound of lepers will overflow. The flowers, the clouds, the wind, the open sea. It is a part of the contemporary Christian music, even flowers. And I use the processing. Processing is a basic programming language for artists and designers initiated by Ben Fry and Casey Reese. We can download the processing for free from processing.org website. And it is my plural illustration by using processing. If you see, it's very simple. You can see the setup function on the top, draw function at the bottom, the setup function is screen size 800 pixel by 800, background 255, it's white. And if you go to draw function, I'm using translate to create a flow from the center. I'm using full statement to duplicate patterns. And then I'm using beige vertex function to create beige vertex here to create floral element. And I duplicated from here to here by using mouse X and mouse Y function with the translate function. Also, I randomized the scale of flowers by using random function and scale function that you can see. And you can see that from my initial sketch from the left end, create a generative system to duplicate and randomize with a specific style of floral illustration. And it has been duplicated to create density and complexity by using mouse X and mouse Y function. If you may have some experience in processing, it's very easy to adapt mouse and X and mouse Y function. Then the floral illustration embedded into gene or narrative library of processing to create gene narrative typography. So from my initial illustration that I embedded my floral illustration into the letter F by using geomerative library in processing. This is from tutorial number seven, hello world get pointers in Geomerative library in processing. Geomerative library in processing make vector drawings or typographies easy to access the paths, the handles, and pointers. When we use a pen tool in Illustrator, we are using handle, control point, anchor point to manipulate the shape of a curve. It's a similar principle. Then I'm gonna go to the so. The geomerative library is this tutorial making easy to develop the geomerative typography and geometry pieces in processing. And I'm using mouse Y function to control the entity. I embedded the push metrics and pan metrics. And this is exactly, if you see that you will put your own code here, then you can copy paste your illustration into here. Then this is the initial that I use a seed typeface Arvini. Then this one, I use a seed typeface Times New Roman, which is one of the most popular serif typefaces in the world. Then this is that I am in using scale function, random function to control the density. And this one, this is the final letter F. In 
computation, you don't need to create a full alphabet set from A to Z. You can just switch the letter F to flowers in text function in processing like this. That was the final one. Then this is a Korean character code, which means flower in English. It was published in UDA, United Designs Alliance, annual 2020. And it was my solo exhibition at Trinity International University in Illinois. And I'm gonna go to the next one. So here is I want to share with you today is embedding computation in typography education already exists. Yes. But still touching entry level of experimental typography outputs, lacking arranging, arranging with the calligraphy, letter art, and typography. How we as design educators would offer foundational, essential, and evolving typography methodology, education, and solutions by using computation as an extension of the calligraphy and letter art. So this is a generative typography system to create floral typography by using computation in graphic design education. Or typography garden. I embedded my typography flowers into a class project, motion typography in the graphic design program in 2019 at the University of Wisconsin Medicine. So this is a class project timelines. Week one, introduction to processing. Week two, computational drawing. Week three, computational illustration. Week four, I introduce geometric library to my students in graphic design major. And week five, typeface choices. Week six, one-to-one -one discussion. Week seven, group critique. Week eight, Final submission. Ideally, according to my experience, it needs at least around uh, seven or eight weeks. And this is created by Yuri Kim. At the beginning, this is to explore how to create illustration, reminding us of flowers in processing that you can see. Then the student investigated the final self chosen typeface as a seed typeface to fit into her own computational illustration. And I introduced how to do it, how to embed their own illustration into the letter form or text in processing. And from here, you can see the initial illustration has been embedded into the specific letter form by using Shomerative Library in processing. And I'm gonna to go to the next one. This is created by Ben Almope from his own beautiful computationally generated illustration into generative typography on the right. This is created by Mo Cheng. Uh, it's a, a Chinese, any audience who may understand Chinese, you may know that it is flower in Chinese. And this is a special characters created by Lauren Cheng and I'm gonna, this is a, a portion of the German poem erased by Edward Wilkes that any audience who may understand German, you may read it, but I prepared in English. This poem discussed the coming of a spring in English, violet, violet already dreaming will soon begin to bloom. Listen the sound of a harp, spring that must be you, it's you I've heard that this is a large poster measuring 84 inches tall by 168 inches wide at Gallery 7 at the University of Wisconsin Medicine. And you can see the German of the violets already dreaming will come begin to bloom. This is the sound of a harp spring that must be you, it's you I've heard. So if you zoom in that, you can see the beautiful detail here. I'm gonna go to the next one. Generative typography. I teach creative coding for graphic design. This is from this Springs course that I wanna share with you. Creative coding for graphic design has unit one, two, three, computational drawing and illustration. Unit two, sound visualization. Unit three, 
computational typography. Let me share my screen again because I need to share with sound. So I'm gonna share the screen again with, um, but I have when I, I have to stop share and I share the screen then I have to click share sound and I will be back to you. Good, thank you for your understanding. Okay, yeah, good. Then, yeah, so it has a unit one to three computation drawing illustration go to computational typography. At the beginning, this is created by Anjika Beruma, the beautiful abstract or floral illustration. Then, this uh, can you? Oh, can you hear the sound? Yes, yes. Great, thank you. It using mouse interaction and keyboard interaction that if we press the keyboard R, it increases the color value of red. If you press the G, it increases the value of the color green. Also, it use mouse and mouse Y function to grow the flowers like this. Then I'm gonna go to the next one. Also, it changed the opacity and stroke weight. And we may see it. Just to finalize my presentation soon. Right. Then you can see the color is changing based on the keyboard interaction. And yes, from this illustration, she embedded this illustration into the letter form. A, small a, like this. And the next one is created by my student, HNY abstract typography by using geometric right domain processing. This is the last piece I want to share with you, created by Josephine Cotra. It's a visual interactive experience in a state of over anxiety during the pandemic, created by Josephine Cotra, that you can see it. It provides for the aesthetic experience of the mind, balancing and compressing stress and anxiousness. You can see. Can you see it? this beautiful illustration has been embedded into letter A. Also, it has the mouse interaction to control the density of the letter A. And this is the another version of, with a different color scheme from here to here. And this is the last one. Yeah, so. This learning system for geometrative or uh, generative typography suggests the graphic design and typography education to explore illustrative and floral typography with the computer coders directly without long-term professional train, training in computer coders. Then future inquiries, if you would be interested in a uh, workshop exhibition presentation regarding product typography by using computation, then this is my email, yahn27 at wist.edu. And also you can visit typeandcode.com and yohyeonan.com. That's all I have today. Thank you so much for watching my presentation. And next presenter will be Taegyeong Lee, who I'm gonna just stop sharing. And he is a professor of graphic design at the University of, uh, no, at uh, Iowa State University. Please welcome Taegyeong Lee. All right, thank you. And uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. All right. Does it look good? You can see the slide. Okay, thank you. All right, let me move these things a little bit. All right, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, my name is Taegyeong, and I'm teaching graphic design at Iowa State University uh, in Ames. Uh, 
Uh, I wouldn't say I like to read uh, my note, but today uh, I have to rely on my script to fly through 15 slides in 15 minutes. So, all right. Uh, designers can use a variety of uh, printing techniques to produce visual materials and to solve visual communication problems. My research explore unconventional materials and alternate solutions to create tangible typography, graphics, and even designed object using digital fabrication. Uh, I infused uh, 3D printing into my practice and have been working with uh, clay. Yes, it's wet clay. Uh, this one is writing love in cursive letter form with clay using my DIY uh, ceramic machine. I've been experimenting with uh, unconventional materials like clay and other digital method to uh, graphic design. Um, like mostly I like to work with uh, ceramics because uh, it has a unique uh, character there. And also uh, it's, it's not really, it is conventional material in art and design, but uh, it's not really conventional material in 3D printing. So I like to just combine and old and new things. Uh, I built my own tools. Uh, my 3D printers are DIY machines uh, based on open source plan. Uh, I'm a designer and also I'm a, I became a tool maker as well. Uh, by the way, this one is the, the biggest printer I've ever built, uh, which is about five foot tall. And I think the build, vo build volume is over uh, three feet, 3.3 feet or something. Uh, these are ceramic type uh, as they are printed with wet clay. Uh, some of them shows the non-linear character of clay. It looks like really soft, but it's not after firing. They could be fired and glazed in electronic kiln like the other ceramic materials. Uh, uh, they have to be fired at uh, cone six, which is used in ceramics about uh, 22, 32 Fahrenheit. And mostly glaze firing takes about uh, one or two days, depends on the size of the kiln. All right, here is the question for you. Uh, can you read it? Uh, it's a sentence using uh, every letter. Uh, I'm sure everyone knows it. Uh, the hint is it's a pangram sentence uh, because we don't have much time. So I'm gonna actually go move to the next slide and we are all visual people. So I'm sure you can guess what it is right now. Yes, it, it really happens. So this is the, yes, uh, it's how it's made. Uh, it's word are extruded uh, three-dimensionally and it isn't easy to read and definitely against the notion of the crystal goblet. Uh, but you know, you might remember this one a little longer because of this experience. Uh, there might be several different ways to print a sentence, but this is one of the possible ways to write a sentence in three-dimensional space with uh, ceramic material. Good typography could be, could still be crystal clear like Beatrice's word, poetic metaphor. Uh, fine typography often disappears playing a supporting role. However, I believe typography shows its physical substance in the real world so we can touch them. Uh, I also have tested different languages on uh, Hangul, which is Korean, uh, Chinese, Japanese, and even Arabic. Uh, you might ask why ceramic and typography uh, in terms of the history of printing and typography, ceramic is a meaningful material. Uh, and we need a, a bit of time travel. Clay is one of the first material our ancestors used for typography around 3200 BC. And as most of you know, this is the clay tablet and cylinder seals. Uh, it might be the high-tech printing method of the time. And, you know, even the ceramic was the high-tech in the past. This is a 3D printed embossor. Uh, it's using same idea as an ordinary embossor. However, it has a modified mechanical system like a cylinder seal. Unlike today's digital printing, the embossing process involves a rich tangible experience, which is more intuitive fun and memorable. Uh, by the way, this one makes the card. Happy, healthy holidays. Uh, it's my business card maker. Uh, I can print my business card anywhere without ink. Just I need a blank paper or even paper tissue or whatever. 
uh, it's another iteration. Uh, it's hand pressed uh, embosser keychain. Uh, it expanded as a class assignment and a workshop format, as it's much easier to design compared to the, the previous one. And uh, as you might notice that there is a magnet there, so it will uh, help with the registration and uh, it will put things together. I mean, the positive and negative dies. Uh, this typeface is made with uh, Hangul consonant and vowel, uh, which is uh, I designed the typeface uh, and uh, I also wanted, wanted to use it uh, to, to make the embosser. It's one of the most exciting demo in my class. Uh, Nutella chocolate and peanut butter were uh, 3D printed on bread bed. Yes, uh, they are edible. Uh, from the top left, the stamp was printed with flexible material. Uh, as a, and an artist book was made out of 3D printed uh, PLA plastic. Uh, it just printed with just one or two layers. Uh, the ETH is the type planner for Basil and no hate was printed and installed across the campus. Uh, it could be installed on a standard railing system or easy to be removed. Simply you can just snap on it and you can remove it. Uh, these are type bracelets and rings. They are printed with flexible material. Uh, they are safe, uh, durable, and more importantly, they are wearable. Uh, it's pretty 3D printed uh, type bookmarks as I cannot work with the clay material much in my home studio uh, since the pandemic. Uh, I'm working with more conventional 3D printing materials. I think this each design takes about 40 minutes to print. Uh, I think it's that I wish I can make it a little bit faster, but uh, still it does its job. Uh, it stay at the top of the book because it has a catch. Uh, it's, uh, I think it will be a new class assignment soon. Uh, many designs could be homemade. I mean, uh, 3D printed at home. Uh, however, certain materials uh, could not could be printed with a professional printing service. Uh, they are designed and sent to Shapeways uh, to be 3D printed with uh, steel and bronze. Uh, this ampersand is uh, designed with Grasshopper and 3D printed. Grasshopper is node-based uh, parametric design tool which runs with Rhino 3D. Uh, Rhino and grasshoppers are widely used in educational and professional environment, architecture, jewelry, etc. Using the parameters, it allows designers to generate 3D design and even 3D type like this one. Uh, from the other screen, uh, I'm changing the parameters so it changes the design real time. It's, it's just simulated right now. So to 3D print it, you have to finalize the design and export it. These letters are designed with uh, different seed fonts and basic shapes using Grasshopper. Uh, with 3D printing, these tools uh, can bring extended tangible experiences. Uh, bubble type was designed and printed with color PLA plastic. Uh, PLA is one of the most popular uh, material in 3D printing, which is made out of cornstarch. Uh, so it's technically a uh, bioplastic. There is a San Francisco based uh, startup company called Lightform uh, developing the projected AR device. I was able to scan the surface and add on additional layer to 3D printed type. Uh, you will see soon, uh, I can put my hand on it and you can see this is the projection. Uh, bubble type was uh, also exhibited through Type Force 11 on annual typography exhibition in Chicago. People were invited to touch letters, especially children love to play with this type. Uh, yes, it was right before the pandemic. I also like to show some student work. Uh, a team of two students designed and 3D printed alphabet card from A to Z uh, that offers unique tactile experiences. Uh, for example, S is scary and the letter has goosebumps on it. They installed it in the library and invited people to write card by scratching the surface with crayon. Uh, this is the lean chair. L is a chair and AN is ottoman. Uh, the chair was made with CNC cut plywood. Uh, I helped them to design it, also uh, operate the machines as well. Uh, a grad student uh, created a multidimensional sculptural letter form inspired by the history of the London ground, uh, which is also known as uh, tube. 
taking the architectural form of the type and merging it with 3D printing. So yeah, these are the hand-pressed embossers my student made last semester. Uh, they designed letter forms and embossers uh, from scratch. And uh, as we have uh, DIY 3D printers uh, in studio, so they can uh, 3D print these embossers. Uh, here's a short video clip. Uh, sometimes uh, the, the embossing is a little bit tricky. So uh, if that happens like this one, uh, you can use the uh, damp paper, uh, so it will help to get the embossing a little bit better. Sometimes uh, if it has a little too much details, it will rip it through. Right. Uh, it could go beyond typography. Uh, we, uh, my student, we used uh, Microsoft Connect as a 3D scanner to scan students' body and digitally sculpt themselves, basically uh, merging their body with the, their spirit animal or some object. Uh, and during the pandemic, I have to stay at home like everyone else. Uh, I was looking for alternate materials to work. Uh, it's a perfect time to work with soap. Uh, I started using 3D printing, casting, and typography. As I've experienced with slip casting, mold making, and casting was fairly easy for me. Uh, it started as a fun side project and a became a design project. After making various soap designs, I naturally think, uh, think thought about designing a package for them. Uh, these packages are made, uh, were made with uh, laser cut paper. And it became a class assignment uh, last fall. Uh, my students were able to experience the design process from the uh, concept development to packaging design. Simply, they have to design the, all the letters and packaging. And I helped with uh, 3D printing and uh, soap making part. They have different themes, such as fun, playful, scary, sci-fi, etc. And here is the, the last step was designing unique package for the soap they des designed. They can see, uh, you can see a range of interesting ideas and designs. Uh, it's a blue bar. Uh, the theme is, you can guess, uh, it's a scary. Uh, yes, wash your hands, germs are scary of soap. 3D printing allows text to be printed, materialized in the physical world using various materials. Uh, the tangible type amplifies visual and physical interactions, and even it could be playable. A designed object or a type presents its own beauty as it is. However, the object could be also a playable toy or performative object, which is, uh, which is designed for players' own winning, whatever it means to them. Uh, my next uh, project will investigate the nature of play and design playable object toys. So, I know many of you have kids and I have, I, I'm happy to share something. This is the 3D printed uh, uh, top, spinning top. Uh, this one is using Sharpie, uh, but you can also, I made a version, you can uh, use uh, Crayola's uh, washable markers. So I made uh, 100 drawings and I made an artist book. So it shows the visuals and everything is, yeah, like, somehow by, but made by accident and also sometimes intentionally. Uh, it's not totally controllable. It's not really under my control. So here's the thing. It's my uh, two daughters of my colleague. So you, if you have a printer or if you can access the printer, you can do the print it and you can spin it with your kids. Just you need a paper. It is washable. So like, no worry about like, don't be panic. Uh, like I don't share the version uh, for the Sharpie. Uh, and sometimes uh, kids, they have hard time to spin it. Uh, so I made a launcher. This is a new design as well. So you can put it in with the launcher design. Put it, I like spinning by hands because it shows more dynamic movement, uh, but also this will be fairly easier to spin it. Uh, by the way, I share the design files so you can, uh, as I mentioned, you can download it and print it and enjoy spinning and make some visual or something fun. All right, I hope this presentation could be inspirational. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Uh, you can find me on Instagram or you can also email me. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, great. I'm always 
impressed by your great presentation, Taegyeong-mi. Thank you so much. That Thank you. I'm happy I made it on time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so we are welcome to have a question at the end of all of the uh, presentations. Uh, next presenter is Justin Lincoln. He is an associate professor of, uh, I'm sorry, at, uh, he is an associate professor of uh, art at Whitman College. He is specialized in creative coding for uh, liberal art education system and human-centered art and design. Please welcome Justin Lincoln. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you uh, for being here. And uh, Takyun, every time I see you present, you're always like raising the bar. So I have to tell you that I am definitely inspired. Um, I'm actually probably going to give you a bit of a break from such lush, beautiful images. Uh, there might be a few in, in my presentation, but mostly I wanna to talk to you about, uh, about learning as well as teaching. Um, I've been teaching for over a decade, but I still feel like a professional student. And um, I like best to learn alongside my students instead of acting as some kind of authority that passes on knowledge, right? And um, I started a project over uh, the quarantine that I wanted to talk about uh, that as much as it's about my own self-education, uh, recently, it's also something that has influenced the way that I'm teaching and the way that I'm making art. So I'll start sharing my screen now. Um, and mostly I'm going to be using Figma, which is one of the many things I've been learning over the last year. Um, so I wanted to start with a scenario. So as, as someone who really likes to learn, um, being at home over the quarantine, I wanted to learn a lot of new things, but I noticed that my computer was filling up with software that I had tried once or twice and never touched again. Has that happened to any of you? Do you have some software in your computer that you're like, it might have been a year or several years ago since I even touched this thing. I don't even know why it's here. Maybe you tried it and it went nowhere and you never just uh, cleared it. Well, in the pandemic, you know, I, I wanted to learn some new things. In fact, I wanted to learn a lot of new things. And um, for about three years, I had been using Instagram as a method of practicing something every day. Um, I started with uh, learning processing and posting a processing sketch every day. Um, I'm gonna switch tabs here. Uh, this is my uh, Instagram. Uh, the building is a camera. And uh, you know, I, while I have uh, continued with processing sketches every day, about a year after that, I started working a lot with sound. And so I made a short experimental sound sketch every day. And so I've done that for two years. But in the last year, I decided that uh, for each month, I would try some new uh, application that I was unfamiliar with, and I would make something new with it and post it on Instagram every day for a month. And most recently, uh, I've been working with a uh, synthesizer software uh, that is totally free called Vital Synth. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a little bit. Um, so I decided that I needed to spend more than a day with any given software to see if it could be useful because I had noticed that after three years of making a processing sketch every day, um, basically I was getting better and I was more confident in the activities that I was doing and my use 
of the software. Um, so I started this project. Uh, I decided in July of 2020 that I would try a different piece of software or hardware each month and make something with it daily. Uh, this has given me a different vantage point with which to look at the contemporary ecosystem of creative technologies, as well as how and what my students may be learning. Um, So another thing with this project is that it makes me think about digital creativity a bit more agnostically in terms of technology and it has allowed me to see connections and trends that I otherwise might have missed. Um, over the uh, quarantine, when we were teaching remotely, I had a number of students that even during the short period of time that Adobe would offer uh, software for free to students, quite a few students didn't have computers that were capable of running some of those apps. And so I really was excited to be more agnostic about what technology we were using. Uh, what interests me a lot more is what sort of creative ends the students might put any given technology towards. Um, so these principles that I've been picking up mostly for myself, um, I've only recently been bringing these principles into the classroom. Uh, last semester, I asked my students to divide into small research groups to pick from a list of freely available or cheap affordable applications or platforms. Um, and they would teach and learn one of those apps together in a group of four or five. Then at the midpoint of the semester, they would present their research along with their own tutorial to be shared with the class and a plan for a final project using their chosen technology. My goal is that they focus on metacognition, which is basically how do they learn best? Now, this kind of small independent group research was done in parallel with also teaching the students P5JS. So um, in my first beginning class where I offered this path, uh, my first groups chose Figma, Blender, Sonic Pi, Twine, and Procreate. Uh, each of these small groups would meet online with me for one hour. And we would talk about, as, as much as we would talk about the software or what they were making, we talked a lot about how they were learning and what they were learning. And uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to be sharing just a couple of case studies with Procreate. Um, so let's see here. Um, going back to my own research over the course of the year, this is what my sort of itinerary looked like. Um, last July, I started by learning a video synthesis software called Lumen. Then I tried Hydra, which is a free online video synthesis programming language. Then I did a month of working with Figma then a month where I shifted to uh, hardware where I was just working with a Wacom tablet. Um, the next month I was working with a Moog Workset synthesizer. Uh, I took kind of a one month hiatus in December. Uh, I was doing a lot of journaling and a lot of things by hand. In January, I started working with a uh, programming language called Touch Designer which is a really wonderful uh, bit of software for uh, working with advanced graphics and interactivity. Um, I also tried ReadyMag, which is a no-code web design app. Uh, then I joined one of the small groups in my class working with Sonic Pi, which is sound programming, uh, and it's free and online. Then I switched to VCV Rack, which is modular synthesis. And this month I thought I was going to be teaching myself GLSL shaders, but after about three days of 
frustration, I switched and I worked with uh, another free online synthesizer. Um, and right now I'm deliberating whether I want to continue this uh, monthly ex experiment over the course of the next year. Um, now, one of the software choices that a number of students chose uh, was Procreate. And I was aware of Procreate for a, um, for quite a while. I think I had even had it on my iPad, but I wasn't really using it. Um, but the enthusiasm that my students brought to it uh, kind of pushed me into giving it a shot. And even when it's not my monthly assignment, sometimes I am still making things with Procreate. Um, actually, I really prefer working with Procreate to a lot of, say, the Adobe suite. It makes Adobe, most Adobe things look like a dinosaur because it's really, uh, it doesn't take forever to load up. You can still work with layers. You're uh, drawing directly on a tablet. It's fast, it's fun, and you can do a whole lot with it. And I wanted to show you just two more examples of things that people have done with it, uh, particularly with some students. Um, so back to this little Figma presentation board. Um, so this is just the contents of a small book that one of my students made using uh, Procreate. And this student is primarily a, uh, a painter who usually works with oils and uh, felt, well, the student was in China and we often had to meet outside of class just because of the time difference. And I know that they, faced certain struggles, sometimes just in terms of uh, motivation. And it reminded me of a question that they asked uh, in a first year class. And I thought it was a great question. Uh, this student, Monica Liu, uh, asked, how do you stay interested in something that interests you? Now that might sound sort of deceptively simple, but maybe that's also at the heart of uh, my overall experiment of trying something, not just for a day, but give it a month. Like try something for a month and see where you're at. You may find that you're in a different place. And so doing something daily was a big part of that. And um, this was part of Monica's daily practice. Um, but I'm just going to show one more uh, student pro uh, project. This was also made in, uh, in Procreate, uh, but it was an animation that honestly, even though I remember the student Saki talking about what she was going to do, it still took me by surprise. In my face. Here we go. So on the this side, I have a koi fish going up and then a dragon going down. It's a, kind of an Asian dragon instead of a European dragon, but it's based off of kind of like, I think it's a proverb, maybe an idiom of how um, there's like a, there's like a story about koi's going up a, a river or a um, waterfall and the koi that does go over the waterfall comes out of the dragon so it's the idea of like going over hardships makes you stronger so yeah that's that's it um i was gonna add perhaps a shadow on the dragon so the fact that this could be done in an app on your ipad just kind of shocked me and i still uh feel like I have so much to learn. And I'm glad that I have an opportunity to work with students that point me in the direction 
of new things that I can learn. And that's it for today. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Justin. I'm always admire your alternate uh, software practice. I love your daily software practice. Was I love your openness of software that sometimes we might rely on specific software more than we should. Thank you for sharing your art and design practice with the AIJ AIJDC committee today. Thank you so much. And so we have the last presenters uh, today that let me just go to this. This is a presentation by Heather Queen and Adam Delmase that Heather Queen is assistant professor of design at Depot University. She is specialized in experience design, speculative design. Also, she has a great leadership to support emerging and diverse designers and educators. And Adam Delmasel is teaching at Pennsylvania College of Art and Design. He is specialized in printmaking design activism with the Corella projection and augmented reality. Please welcome Head of Queen and Adam Temasse. Mm -hmm. Hey everyone. I think maybe Justin has to unshare his screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Huh. So sorry about that. I'm seeing like a double me. It's kind of cool. Okay. Wait, <laughs> Infinite regress. And then I thought it was me. I don't know. It's Friday afternoon, so that's okay. Um, let me share my screen. <clears throat> Okay, everybody can see it. All right, and there is some sound throughout this. I'll be mindful of time, um, so pay attention there. Um, I'm Heather Quinn and my colleague Adam is here. This is actually, I think, Adam, is this the fourth time we've given a version of this talk maybe? I think so. Forms? Um, which has been kind of fun because it's a really big project for us and it's evolving really rapidly. We'll tell you about some of where it's going. And it's nice to have Ali here because we were able to present on her panel at CAA. Um, and so some of that may be familiar, but to get to see new stuff too. Um, <clears throat> so this is Mariah, an augmented reality experience that narrates stories of historical injustice. And it came to be when Adam and I met in graduate school. Uh, he was working on a lot of activism um, through printmaking and about the opioid epidemic. I'll let him speak to that. Um, I had worked in big tech for a really long time, almost 20 years, and had been an adjunct at RISD for about 12, and then pivoted into full-time academia. And so as part of my MFA work, I was really sort of pulling back the covers on big tech and really getting into some of the ethics. Um, but I was playing with AR more uh, from a multi-layer narrative, uh, looking at cryptography, obfuscation, and things like that. So I kind of fell into it by accident using a toy, uh, tool, phone tool that was made for kids, which speaks to, I think, kind of what Justin was saying, um, always playing with things that maybe are sort of outside the boundaries, which also speaks to this talk a little bit. Um, Adam, do you want to speak about your stuff? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm an adjunct professor. I'm, I'm like a, nomi, a roaming, you know, kind of nomad adjunct at all <laughs> places in Pennsylvania. You know, on some days I wash the windows, whatever pays the bills, kind of what I do in academic institutions of Pennsylvania. Um, so uh, my work um, for the last seven years, or eight years has re revolved around the opioid epidemic that's exploding in, in our communities. And it's evolving now into kind of the deeper roots of the addiction crisis in America. And it's also taking me down to the border of Texas and Mexico and doing work kind of um, from kind of origin point to people dying in America, um, kind of and why we consume what we do in, in America. So Heather and I met in grad school. I think right away we were, we were um, drawn to each other. Um, one thing about our, our partnership and why I, I like partnering with her so much is she, I'm the kind of uh, artist and designer that's, you know, is more about kind of jumping in with two feet. And if we get arrested, then that's what happens. Um, and Heather uh, teaches me to slow down and think about things more completely, which makes the work better. Um, and every now and again, I get Heather to feel better about getting in trouble. So it, it, it ends up being a really, really great partnership. So I'm honored, overly honored to be working with her. Yeah. 
I mean, I think a collaboration is really key uh, for, for this project, but especially throughout my trajectory of my life, again, working in big tech and all these projects, like there's hardly any project I'm able to do on my own because it's just with stuff like this, just the way it is. So um, this is a video of Mariah um, as a child. It's one of the key pieces on the uh, Mariah website. Um, and I feel like Adam, you should just speak a little bit about her and then maybe we can explain that. Yeah, so um, so part of my research and part of what I'm doing is, I mean, for a long time, I was telling the story of my brother. I, I lost a brother to an overdose in 2014 and that's what changed the trajectory of my life in just about every way and definitely why I make work and how I teach. Um, so part of like me telling my brother's story is that I would start, I started protesting and traveling around the United States and I met a mother named Rhonda Lottie who lost her daughter um, in 2011 to an overdose, we became friends. Um, so it just made sense to um, use her as kind of the witness for this project, right? So Mariah is the witness for this project. Um, and that's kind of what you learn about through uh, this augmented reality experience at the Met. Yeah. So I realized since this is the fourth time we've done this talk that we haven't maybe explained as well as we could um, just how this app works. Um, so one of the things I realized when I was sort of hacking AR in graduate school, I, like I'm, I'm always like digging and digging and I thought, oh, this is weird. I wonder if I could put AR in someone's apartment without even being there. And so I would put AR in my friend's apartments and then you'd be like, oh yeah, there it is. And I thought, this is crazy. You could put AR anywhere. So I really started to dig into the ethics of what the future of the AR cloud looked like, what it meant for our privacy. I started meeting with lawyers and trying to understand like kind of more the policy behind the future of this technology. And then Adam and I had heard of this um, exhibition called Project Anywhere that we decided to use as a like a motivation to get this project going. And so we spent a lot of time putting together this proposal um, and as such, got um, some really good peer review, got provisional, provisionally accepted. Um, and then they asked uh, if it was legal. And so I had, we really had to dig and we couldn't find anyone to answer if what we were doing was legal. I'll tell you what we did in a minute. Um, finally, we found an AR attorney uh, who was able to answer that, yes, indeed, it was legal. Um, we still got rejected from, from the exhibition, which is even really interesting. Uh, we can get to that later. Um, but so what we did, then COVID happened and we couldn't even go to the Met, but we were able to augment these artifacts in the Met uh, without even going there. Um, because if you understand augmented reality, it it's basically like a QR code. Your phone overlays your environment and either a trigger image or your geolocation makes something appear on your phone. So it's some, if you don't know about it, it can seem really complicated. It's actually very, very simple. Um, and so, and there's some other ways to make it happen. Um, but in, in the case of our MET augmentation, we re-augmented artifacts in the Sackler wing. Um, and so when your phone goes over a particular artifact, it will reveal statistics about the opioid epidemic. And I'm going to have Adam speak to why we we re-augmented these particular. Yeah, so I mean that's it's, that wing is significant because the majority of that wing was paid for with opioid money over the last 75 or 80 years, right? So I mean, if you're if you're watching the news right now and you've seen the last 12 week um, protest at MoMA, and they're protesting because people on their board um, supported destroying Palestinians, people are interested more and more interested in where the money comes from, right? That's the thing you have to understand about museums is that when you go into a museum, you see names carved on walls. I mean, granted, we're talking about one family that used their money by destroying people to do this thing, but almost every single one of those wings are some type of capitalist or oligarch that on the backs of human suffering, we're able to make money to donate a $50 million painting to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So it's really, you know, it's really about laying, um, but using this wing to lay um, a foundation for a more truthful American narrative on top of kind of the answers that are given. It's this James Baldwin kind of like idea of looking for the answers to hide or looking for the questions that hide behind the answers, right? So on a total side note too, I just wanna let you guys know that if this lawyer would have came back and told us that it was illegal, I still would have talked Heather. <laughs> yeah. It was gonna happen. I, I mean, all they would done given us a cease and desist, so it was fine. But um, so yeah, so you get to the museum, you have downloaded the Mariah app on the app store. We were also weren't sure if Apple and Google would, would pass it, um, but it's on the app store so you can download it. Um, and you go to the map and you walk through this wing and there we have a map so you can see which artifacts they have both statistics and audio so Mariah's mother 
Do you hear it? See like universal statistics, but Mariah's mother is giving the story of her life. So you have the singular narrative of her, this human, this person, you know, simultaneously have the statistics about the Sacklers. And then when you get to the final Temple of Dender, uh, we rename it for her. So it's it's not named, you'll, well, you'll see pictures of that as we go. And that, that's kind of a significant thing too. Like, I mean, I, I'm assuming it's all educators in here to think about that when we have our students dive into areas like this, they need to be telling stories of individual people and not statistics. I mean, there's a, just, there's a statistic that almost 60% of statistics are made up on the spot. So if we have our <laughs> students using them, it means nothing. It's a generality, it's visual and verbal noise. Yeah. So having them um, really understand the singular brings the maximal into focus, right? So it always has to start with kind of uh, the, the individual story. Yeah, and I think the more we've presented this project, it, it really touches on so many different things. It's a really hard project and really hard story to tell. So we get better each time. Um, and you can see some of the systems of power that we challenge with this project um, in particular. I mean, and I think for me, having worked in tech, I'm never really interested in using tech as it's given to me, but to rethink, reinvent, hack it, break it, maybe make a whole new tech. So, so for me, it's really sort of thinking about those kinds of things. Also along with my students, like if my students, I don't really have them work in AR, I'll say, let's design a speculative interface. So I'm, I never sort of think about a specific technology more about an idea, if that makes sense. Um, just gonna sort of quickly go through some of these slides. Okay, we're at, oh, we got six minutes. I'll just give you a minute to kind of read some of that. Um, yeah, so I mean, one of the aspects of this project too that is really interesting to me. I mean, I mean, I mean, you have to also some of my background to understand. Like, my work started with making a thousand, five thousand screen prints. Is how I dealt with my grief, and I picked them mm -hmm. out of my town, and my local police department destroyed them because they didn't want the message to get out. Then it switched to large scale building projections, so they didn't like little thirteen by nineteen inch posters. Now they have to deal with a thirty foot by eighty foot projection on the side of a building. That's limited by nighttime. And now this next, this next, you know, kind of. Uh, range in augmented reality is something that can be hacked in space and it cannot be taken down yet until bezos learns how to buy all of this which he will at a certain point we're going to steal it for as long as we possibly can and reuse it for free and that's the power of this i think heather and i sat at one point trying to figure out like if we were to bill for all of this work that we did it might be a five hundred thousand dollar project right yeah. we did that for free and we're giving it away for free. So when you talk about uh, challenging systems of power, there's nothing more dangerous than someone that works for free. Um, and that's a really important part of this for me. That rhymes. Yeah. <laughs> and you can see, so you can see some of the augmentations here um, because, because again, it's for those of you that have worked in AR, it's really hard to showcase and exhibit. So we, we um, have been supported with some student researchers and we recently just got, got awarded a grant. So we're, we're actually very rapidly working on a documentary film, a short film. Uh, we'll start filming in New York on uh, July 9th-ish. And then it's gonna be disseminated in a few museums and conferences in the fall, which is really, really exciting. And I think, I think it'll be a much easier way to tell the story because um, obviously everyone can't get to New York um, to see a site-specific installation like this. Yeah, I saw, I saw that question pop up a second ago that answered that question. Yeah, at this part of the project is only viewable at the Met because we're talking about this story at the Met. What's significant oh, about yeah. the family or the Sackler family is that they've used a lot of their, for a good piece of their fortune to art wash the public, right? It's a giant fig leaf of, of $50 million paintings that hides the dirty bits of all of what they've done, right? So we're peeling back that fig leaf at the Met, but it would, I mean, Almost every art institution you can think about in the world, at least some money has seeped into those areas. Um, so we're, you know, the idea is that eventually it will travel to those different places. Yeah, and it's it's interesting too, because we bootstrapped this so much, you know, I mean, it was like, like it's a very simple flat um, augmentation. We're actually working as you'll see now with 3D rendering um, with a researcher, um, and sort of making the augment the typography in in virtual space more sculptural, more three dimensional. You can walk behind it. You can sort of interact with it more. Um, so it's been just also an evolution of theory and learning as we go. 
um, and work. And I think the really amazing thing was because of COVID and because we built it entirely remotely without being at the Met, there was the day, and I still haven't even seen it. I haven't even got to see this in person. Ad, there was a day that Adam went to test it with Mariah's mom. So she was the first one to actually use it. And I kept texting him, did it work? Did it work? I want to know, did it work? Um, we, were, we were too and, busy like holding each other and crying. Like, <laughs> and it worked. Like, Get these insane so, people out of here. Like they are. <laughs> yeah. There's her mom. So. That's, yeah, that's Mariah's mom, Rhonda. Yeah. Who's an activist in her own right and just a general badass. Yeah. Uh, we also augmented um, physically printed things. So we augmented the Metropolitan map um, and also the Metropolitan logo. So everywhere is a Met logo and you use our app, um, Mariah, the video of Mariah comes up. So it's really interesting to think that you can have a physically printed thing, um, but the, but the, Thing that augments on top of it, we have the power to change or control uh, what what people will see, which is which interesting. Is pretty yeah, when you go into the Mets gift store, it's amazing. It's like Mariah, Mariah, Mariah. Her face pops up on everything. Oh, here's a little video. Yeah, yeah, you can see some of that. The sound doesn't really matter so much. Um, but what I was going to say about the future of AR is right now you can only see AR, AR through specific apps. But if you research the future of the cloud, FAAMG, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, they're all fighting over the power of the AR cloud. And most scholars will say they think it may be the singular most important um, thing in the future of computing. So it's possible that at some point, like the internet, the AR cloud is everywhere and everywhere you go, everything is augmented, like years down the road, or maybe not even that far. And so we're kind of like with this showing what could, could happen if there's no, no sort of thought about freedom of speech or private property, public property laws over our virtual space. Um, so we're, we're sort of showing some things there so you can see that a little bit. And then you can see, I'm trying to remember where the sound is. I think it's- My daughter's sound. name is Mar Oh, sorry. Ah, oh, sorry. I don't know My daughter's name is Mariah Lodi. See, I'm so good at tech. My daughter's name is Mariah Lottie. She was murdered by the family whose name adorns this wing of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The Sackler family's goal was capitalism at all costs, and their reward was riches beyond imagination and a trail of death and destruction that has left families across this nation forever fractured and those left behind searching for answers they will never receive. Today, we rename the swing of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in honor of Mariah Lottie as a memorial to her and to the true cost of the addiction epidemic crippling our country. We paid for this with our capital and with our blood. So, I mean, what's significant about this wing to the Temple of Dendor, which if, if you guys have been to the Met, this is one of their big show pieces, this, this giant wing with this waiting pool around it. I mean, what's amazing about that and terrible about that is that temple was built by Caesar Augustus right after he subjugated the people of Egypt. He had this, uh, this, this temple built um, in the traditions of Egypt, although he, he is carved into the stone of it along with the traditional. And the wing is paid for by the Sacklers, which is just, you know, 800 years, a thousand years into the future is doing the exact same fucking thing with capitalism, right? So it's, I mean, and, and if, you, if, you, if you search this, like you'll also see like Chanel will come in and do their gaudy Egyptian wing uh, fashion show in the temple of Dendor. So it's really, I see that temple and that space being a real symbol of capitalism through time. Um, and, and really kind of where we don't want to go with it. So the idea that she can be, Mariah can take that over, and now she is now a witness and lives in that wing, um, seems to be a, a perfect way of showing this terrible history. So in the future, um, we are re-augmenting other locations. Uh, like I mentioned, we have, we got some funding to build this documentary short, which is kind of exciting. Um, so you can see uh, some of the reaches of the Sackler family, um, and we're gonna give you a sneak peek into something that is upcoming. Um, so we are going to be augmenting any day now, we've tested it, um, at least we, we tested at my house or Adam's house, we haven't been to Paris yet. Um, but this one's a little different because this particular augmentation um, that you can see the typography is more sculptural and three-dimensional. It will also reflect into the pool, um, but it's called death in real time. And it's kind of like a ticker clock that changes every seven minutes um, to represent opioid deaths. 
and it yeah. works via geolocation. So whereas the mat worked with trigger images, this knows where your phone is and then will reveal. And I think theoretically we had this, it's like the way we work is we'll have this idea and then we just figure it out. So we thought, oh, you know, in, in AR, do we have the capability to figure out how to reach a database and change the numbers every seven minutes? Um, and we figured it out. I mean, I'm sure Pokemon Go reaches a database, but we don't have millions and millions of dollars. So we just start bootstrapping things. So. Um, so Plus, I'm, I'm a dumb yeah. shit printmaker, so I just give ideas. To <laughs> yeah, out. we just have ideas and figure it's really it out. Cool if we could do this, and they're like, All yeah. Right, so my cousin uh, works in Paris, and um, she'll get like a link to go test it on the app and see how the augmentation works. Right now, I've been testing it in my dining room. I was going to show you a picture of it over my daughter, um, and so we're kind of like hacking around. Um, but I'm going to play the last bit of audio, uh, which this particular augmentation has Adam's father um, speaking about this. So we have two more minutes. My son's name is Joseph de Marcel and he was murdered by a benefactor of this historic museum. The Sackler family, makers of OxyContin, supported the Louvre, and the Louvre willingly accepted capital built on deception, subjugation, and the death of our children. In 2019, Sackler name was removed from the walls of the Louvre amid controversy in an attempt to whitewash history, presenting an account more palatable to the public and more importantly, future financial supporters. The silence of a blank wall can be a great comfort. Things that are frightening can be reduced to nothingness by silence. We must not forget history or the silence of comfort will doom us to repeat. The number you are viewing above your head, funded by loss, death in real time, is the legacy of Arthur Sackler and his family and the institutions that have blindly accepted payment over conscience. Once started, this number will increase by one every 7.2 minutes, representing death in real time. You'll be a witness to our loss, a participant in our grief, and a carrier of our burden. Now that you are involved, what are you prepared to do? Joey died September 19th, 2014. He was 33 years old. Mm -hmm. Okay, Adam. <laughs> I don't, we've, we've not played yeah, that publicly. Hearing my dad's voice. I mean, that, that's the thing about this piece and why I think students need to think about what a museum and what a gallery is all about, right? These are not vacation destinations. These are places where we're supposed to go and bring something back into our lives. We're supposed to change um, what we do, what we think. And if we just ask, can answer or ask one question, it's a huge win, right? And that's the thing this piece does because it changes in real time. And you can witness the number go from 400,000 to 400,001. You now are witnessing death in real time. So the question is, how can we now turn away from that? You know, and the hope is that, you know, I don't, I, I don't like, I'm not naive to think it's going to change that many lives, but if it changes one or two, that's enough. And even if they know and they do nothing, that's enough for me, right? It's, it has to be, um, we have to be challenging our audiences to do something especially in this realm of total um, visual overload and visual noise. Like, how do we break through that? And again, we break through that by teaching our students to tell singular stories, not generalities. Um, so anyways, I'll get off my soapbox now. We'll talk <laughs> I later. I was gonna say, you can read some more press um, at some of these uh, places. Um, and then I, we just have had such a team of so many, we've had already had five or six students help this project through student research funds from DePaul. Um, my husband, who's a lawyer, and Brian Wassum, who was the AR attorney, if you want to read his scholarship on AR law, it's pretty awesome. Uh, we could not have figured out a lot of this without him, which is some of our sources, which if this is being recorded, you can screenshot it later. Um, and then our contact info. So right at 15 minutes. Okay. <laughs> I think, yes. All right. Thank you. Great. It's such a powerful and important project. I'm very happy to finalize the panel presentation <laughs> by Heather Queen, Heather Queen and Adam Demas. It's a very, very important project. So we have around 11 uh, minutes to finalize this panel discussion that uh, I'm welcome to have questions from the audience. 
If you may have a question, you can uh, just put your question on the chatting window or you can ask me or uh, ask us directly. Okay. So we have a question from Emil Tenjo. What distinction do you make between interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary design? Emil, are you asking to all the panelists? Mm -hmm. Okay. Also, oh, it's a. Oh, sorry. Anyone who wants mm -hmm. to answer that? <laughs> That's who I'm asking. And then, of course, there's antidisciplinary, right? <laughs> yeah, some of us have poor discipline. Back. I know. <laughs> yeah. I would say that your project is clearly transdisciplinary to me, yeah. clearly. But I wouldn't say that in all the other cases. So I'm just curious to know yeah. why you use that term. That's all. But I mean, anyone, anyone who wants to answer. Oh, yeah, because I'm the person who shaped this panel discussion that I, you, yeah, that's an excellent foundational question between interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary that it's not easy to define clearly, but Tegium list project, I think it might be it might be under the category interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. Tegium, do you agree? Mm -hmm. Also, Justin Linker's practice may be uh, interdisciplinary, also it's a little bit transdisciplinary, can be. So how about Tegium Lee and Justin Lincoln? Do you have any input to add? I think, uh, yeah, I agree with you. Sometimes the, you know, there's interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, transdisciplinary. Sometimes we are using this word, but sometimes it's, we, we cannot just completely define it, but, or like, but I agree my work is more like close to inter or cross-disciplinary because sometimes like I'm from graphic design background, but if sometimes I work with some like ceramic materials much more or Really printed. Sometimes, like it feels like really just crossing the boundary sometime or pushing the boundary. But in that sense, uh, like yeah, my my work can be. I agree. Like it's not really transdisciplinary, but it's more like cross or interdisciplinary. Uh, personally, I like cross disciplinary better because inter. Uh, like it's a little bit difficult, but I like, I just like to use analogy. Like it's kind of digging the ground. If you like to digging the ground, do you like to digging the boundary of the ground so go a little deeper or but to go deeper simply you have to dig wider so you can go deeper because you cannot go super deep if you have done any digging you know you know that so I think uh, like probably that might be uh, an analogy to describe this uh, the terminologies I think my answer might be a little more oblique um, I think it's it's very influenced by the fact that I, I teach at a small liberal arts college. And um, I've also taught at large research universities. And it's interesting how disciplines, disciplinary boundaries, majors, all of these are often caught up in um, not only discourses, but connected to politics and money and things like that. Whereas I'm really interested in like, the whole creative individual and much in the way that I'm agnostic about what kind of software someone might be using. I'm agnostic about discipline. If someone's doing something creative and interesting, I will be interested. Thank you, Justin and Taegyeongmi. We have a, another question that this question to Hedo and Adam that Okay, let me just go to, oh, we have several. So what is the relationship between the augmented reality and the art itself? Not the money laundering, but the actual art practice, yes. Yeah, I mean, I mean- the, That's the, a good question. The deeper, the deeper is, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, just think about, you know, an Egyptian artifact going anywhere in the United States and also, like start to think about the fact that 95% of what you're viewing was never meant to be viewed in the first place. Mm -hmm. Someone stole it from the ground. And whether, whether we feel good about it coming to the United States because we saved it, 
oh, we, we are the saviors of this thing. And now we can look at it. There's implication for the idea that first off, this isn't art in the first place. It's not meant for us to see and view. That's the vacation destination of a, a museum that I'm talking about. It's that us going there, um, just, just feel we saw this amazing thing. Well, did you ever stop to think about the fact that, that amazing thing was for someone's journey into the afterlife. It's not about you at all. You're not supposed to see this thing. Um, and that's actually, I mean, that's that's a huge part of what's happening in the United States right now, where we're, pro, I mean, this decoloniz decolonizing of art collections to think about where they came from, returning them to their original origin. Um, so there isn't necessarily a specific connection to the artifact and the factoid that pops out, but I will say this, you know, Arthur Sackler, one of the reasons why oligarchs and, and huge capitalists buy art and hold it until they die and then it gets bequeathed to a museum is that that their name is now attached to that artifact from this point until the smithsonian decides to give it back so when you go to the asian art museum at the smithsonian it's the arthur sackler ceremonial bowl for this very specific ceremony so he's now attached himself whether it's wanted or not into that ceremony into that piece so um, yeah, sorry, I'm gonna, I, I could go on this forever. I was gonna add one thing too, which I love Natasha's question, um, is the design has so many different legs for us now. So there's the direct user experience and there's probably a real small percentage of people who will actually directly experience the mat. I didn't. So it gets disseminated through the press, through our teaching, through our learning here together. But I've also become really interested in design for policymaking. There's a studio called Superflux in London who does a lot of, they'll make like the projects like this, but then they present them to governments. So I like my dream would be to share these projects, work with attorneys and, and start to write policy before big tech is like in bed with us and not only listening to us, but augmenting our space. So I'm learning how to do that. I just got a fellowship to work with the business in the law school for tech ethics and I'm really excited about. So I, maybe I won't make change directly through a user, but I can show the project and make some change that way, if that makes sense. If any of your policymakers feel free to write me and help me out. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. Uh, that we have around the three minutes to finalize this panel discussion. Oh. And Megan, do you? Oh, yes, Megan, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, thank you. So first of all, thank <laughs> you all so much for presenting beautiful work. Uh, great panel. Uh, so my question is really for Adam and Heather, and mm -hmm. I really liked what you're talking about. Uh, developing a more truthful narrative. And I actually like the complexity of these things and sort of turning what you might think of as good, like a museum uh, or Disney or <laughs> things of that nature, and then <laughs> taking a deeper dive into that. A colleague of mine actually is working on a project called the Monument Public Address System, where she's using augmented reality on top of Confederate monuments. Here oh, in Virginia, yeah, we've got a lot of them. Yeah. And yeah. So, um, that is a little more direct because they're Confederate monuments and you, you know what you're getting into, but again, layering of the story. So in your case, I guess what I'm wondering is, you've talked about sort of this systemic policy change, but what would be the ideal reaction of the museums? You know, is there a response that well, you have to get? Yeah. We had this crazy thing happen where when we applied to Project Anywhere, they provisionally accepted us, then last minute rejected us. And if you look at the winners of the year we were supposed to be in it, one of the winners is from Parsons and worked directly with the Met um, on an AR project where they co-opted a lot of our text and said, we're really questioning um, projects that did stuff like this. So I think that there was something happening behind the scenes. I was pretty pissed off about it. Um, and it made me not really wanna share this work to peer review or to, to things like that because I felt like they wanted ours, didn't use it, and then presented another person's work who was basically doing, saying, you should work nicely with the museums. You can look it up on Project Anywhere. Adam, do you remember the name of it? Um, I can't remember, I think I, yeah. I mean, I'll say, you know, for me, it's twofold, right? It's, I mean, first off, I want the Sackler family buried under the jail. <laughs> well, I want them giving $600 million fines doesn't mean anything to a $14 billion arc, uh, oligarch, right? So that's the first. So that's, that's the long fight. And we're getting there. I mean, we're really grassroots um, protests like this is why they are currently trying to file for bankruptcy to get out of having to pay. 
even though they sent $8 billion overseas in the, in, this, in the midst of this to save their money. So that's the first one. The second thing when it comes to museums, I'm not anti-museums. I want museums to be transparent about their histories. So if I, if I travel to Cologne, Germany, that one of their most important museums in Cologne is the Gestapo headquarters. They embrace the terrible parts of their history for us to be able to move forward. In America, we don't embrace those because we're afraid someone's not gonna pay it's also in American museums. I mean, the number one uh, topic that's not taken on in American museums is Palestine. And that's because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of money from the other side of that fight in museums. So they won't take it on. So my, for me, if the Met was gonna make it right and they wanted me to go away, they would permanently name that wing the Mariah Lottie Gallery. That would be the ethical thing to do. And, there, and it would be no skin off their back to do it. And a beautiful gesture. And if the Met would do it, I mean, the Met is considered the most important art museum in the world to a lot of people. I mean, it's not. It's kind of a shitty museum. But it's. But if they did that, that would be. It would do nothing for them other than to be the progressive museum that they want to be. Um, so if they would rename it to her to her name or to one person that died, I'd be satisfied. And then the, the other fight is I'll, I'll never stop. I'm going to continue to go after these people that are destroying our communities. Um, and deeper than that is figuring out why we consume what we consume. That's the bigger question. You know, why is it that in America we can we have to consume as much as we do? So anyway. And I loved what you said too about complexity and that we need to be able to deal more with these complex histories. Great. Yeah. Oh, oh, thank you so much. Oh, that because it's my responsibility to finalize this panel discussion now. That thank you so much for AIG, ADC steering committee so tough to support this panel discussion today. Thank you for all the panelists, Taegyeongmi, Justin Lincoln, Head of Queen, and Adam Delmasse to participate in this wonderful panel. Thank you so much for all that. And that's it for today. Thank you so much. And thank you for putting it all together and hosting the panel. You were amazing. And this was an amazing, humbling, and um, powerful panel. So we appreciate everything that you're doing. Um, we shared our, our social media links on there. So if you want to follow us and keep tabs of what we have coming up, we'd appreciate it. And um, thanks again for joining us on this Friday afternoon, wherever you are. And we hope to see you next time. Thank you all. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Heather, thank you. Heather, Justin Lincoln, Adam, take, if you might have time that you may stay, we may just check. Oh, okay. Yeah, what's sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we may stay. That's... I never know when I'm speaking.